the marketing coordinator for the Metropolitan Business League, and she's going to welcome you and introduce our first speaker. Melody, take it away. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. On behalf of the Metropolitan Business League, our board of directors and CEO Floyd Miller, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual town hall created to ensure we continue our commitment to minority and women-owned businesses and show our ability to pivot during unprecedented times. We are so excited to present this series today to inform, educate, and guide small businesses and nonprofit organizations in lieu of COVID-19. Also, we invite you to learn more about the NBL to include programming opportunities, special events, and promotions. Um, most recently, we have launched a free membership opportunity for the next few months um, up until June 30th. This allows individuals to take advantage of our robust offerings now because again, we realize during unprecedented, time, unprecedented times require unprecedented measures and sources of support. So you will be able to access um, this information on our website, the mbl.org, along with ways in which you can continue to support the MBL so that we can continue doing the important work of serving the small business community. So without further ado, I'm so excited about our session today and our guest panelists. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Lisa Sims, CEO of Venture Richmond, a nonprofit organization that engages business and community leaders in partnering with the city to enhance the vitality of the community, particularly downtown. Venture Richmond promotes the betterment of downtown through economic development, marketing, promotion, advocacy, and events. Previously, she was deputy director overseeing festival and festivals and events, marketing and development. Prior to Venture Richmond, Lisa was vice president of marketing for what is now Richmond Region Tourism. And before moving to Richmond in 1998, she was executive director of the Asheville, North Carolina Convention and Visitors Bureau. So without further ado, take it away, Lisa. Thank you, Melody, I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I want to thank the NBL for having me today. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to uh, give you a lot of information you don't already have, but I'm going to try. Uh, Melody did a great job of talking about who we are. We are the downtown organization. Uh, we do everything we do is designed to get people to live, work, or play, or explore downtown Richmond. Uh, and this is basically our service district that you can see here, the red line that goes around. Everyone who's a property owner within that district uh, helps to fund the activities of Venture Richmond. And we provide both essential and enhanced services uh, for the city. Uh, we do clean and safe and beautification, and we do uh, riverfront and canal walk maintenance. We operate the historic canal cruises, we do festivals and events, we do downtown placemaking and downtown marketing. You all probably have seen uh, clean and safe staff around downtown uh, and that group of folks basically takes care of a 440 block area, trash, leaves, steaming sidewalks, removing weeds, that sort of thing, keeping downtown looking nice. And we also do downtown beautification in all of these areas that you see. Um, we also operate, as I said, the Riverfront Canal Cruises, which has about 30,000 visitors a year. This is a tourist attraction downtown. This is at the Turning Basin. And then you can see here uh, the Canal Walk itself, uh, which we also manage and maintain for the city of Richmond. And then Browns Island, we also maintain as a public park space, as well as uh, an event venue. So we basically manage the riverfront from Browns Island eastward until about 18th Street, 18th and Dock Street, where the Capitol Trail begins. We also do downtown placemaking, and here you can see a picture, a couple of pictures of last year we did the largest parking day that uh, Richmond has seen. We had about 30 folks who turned parking spaces into mini parklets for the day, and it was a great, great event. We also do festivals and events. Uh, many of you are familiar with some of these, Friday Cheers, which has been around for over 30 years uh, on Browns Island, an eight concert summer series. We also do Dominion Energy River Rock with our partners and sports backers. All of these events are designed to bring people downtown, obviously. Uh, and we also do the Second Street Festival, which is uh, sort of a celebration of the Jackson Ward neighborhood and the history of that neighborhood. Uh, and it has about 45,000 people who attend 
every year. River Rock has about 100,000 people. Uh, and then the Richmond Folk Festival, which is the largest folk festival of its kind in the country. And we host about 200,000 people a year at this event on the downtown riverfront. We also do marketing. We're sort of the power behind the RVA uh, mark uh, image there. We did not come up with it. We didn't invent it. RVA has been around a really long time, but we did put a lot of power behind it and behind uh, all of the, the uh, bumper stickers that you see often. Uh, we also do a dining guide and we also have a very robust website, which I encourage you to visit. Uh, you can find any place you want to go downtown and where you park to get there and how you get there. Um, so visit our website. So to the matter at hand, um, again, I think we're all, uh, you know, as, as we were talking before this, um, we're not really, not, I don't think anybody has obviously dealt with anything like this, so I'm not sure any of us know precisely what we're doing, but we are trying to uh, react uh, in, a, in a positive way and in a stable way. So this is sort of the order that we went through, our staff. Um, my first concern was, was the staff, was the people uh, we work with every day and confirming that they are healthy and in a, a stable uh, space. Uh, and sort of over communicating with them. We went from having one staff meeting a week to three staff meetings a week. And these are Zoom meetings so that we can all see each other on a regular basis. I think that's very important. Also maintaining frequent check-ins and other meetings via Zoom, Teams, or FaceTime, whatever you have available. Make sure that you're talking as a staff, that you're interacting. Honestly, a, a lot of things that, that can go with just an email these days, I might just pick up Zoom and, and talk to somebody in person, so to speak. Uh, and be honest about budget challenges. Uh, nobody wants any surprises. And I think, frankly, that's the first thing everybody thinks of uh, when a situation like this occurs. And also try as best you can to maintain a routine uh, and encourage others to maintain a routine. Financial stability is next, obviously. Uh, you need to make a really realistic assessment uh, of your budget going forward, and this requires brutal uh, and sometimes very unpleasant honesty. Uh, assumptions may shift quickly, and they have. From the first week that we uh, were working from home to this week, we've probably gone through about three different uh, budget scenarios. Um, but we have finally landed upon formulating the worst case scenario. How bad could it get? And to get to this point, there can be no sugarcoating. You have to be honest, again, that brutal honesty, and talk about how bad it might get. And then if it gets there, how will you react? How will you deal with it? And then based on that worst case, devise a monthly cash flow projection. We found this to be critical. Um, and I'm, again, many of you are probably already doing this, but um, you know, finding out, looking at a budget is one thing at the bottom line when you get to the end of the year. But are you going to have enough money every month to have cash when you need it? If you're expecting a huge infusion or a nice infusion of cash in November, that's not going to help you in June. Uh, and then also volunteer leadership, board of directors, contributors. Uh, this is another area where we're trying to over communicate. Uh, obviously, I am in more close contact with my, the chairman of my board, uh, the executive committee, but begin face-to-face -face meetings with this group as soon as you can. Uh, pull folks in, even when normally you might not pull them in, just so that you can keep your lines of communication open and get buy-in on your decisions. You don't want any surprises either among your staff or your board of directors. And then maintain contact with your contributors and sponsors and see how they're feeling about things going forward. Um, some of the actions resulting uh, for us have been very deep budget cuts. We went through uh, our worst case budget and it required deep, deep cuts. Now, all of our essential services are still required, clean and safe and beautification. And then all the maintenance we do on Riverfront and Canal Walk, including Browns Island. But now they have even uh, more increased safety procedures. And there are even more people, frankly, who are in these public spaces looking for those safe outdoor spaces where they can, they can get out a little bit. We're also looking at event cancellations. We have already canceled Dominion Energy River Rock. We've uh, canceled uh, the first month of Friday Cheers, which is May. We are looking very closely at June now, and honestly, everything is on the table as we look ahead. 
uh, our canal cruise season. Uh, we are we did not open April 1st and we're looking at the possible cancellation of the entire season. So with event cancellations and the canal cruise possible cancellation, the way many of the ways where we engage the community, where we're most outward facing, are going to be gone to in large degree. Um, so in the next few weeks, we're going to be working to formulate a new marketing and business plan because the other one is out the window. Um, we're shooting a virtual canal cruise right now to be offered to school groups. Lots of school groups have had to cancel, obviously, uh, but this is very popular in the spring with schools. But others can also enjoy it on our website. And, and we're also looking at uh, the possibility of virtual music events and, and any other ways that we can seek to re-engage the community as we've had to step back a little bit. Um, and we're working with uh, downtown business owners, hopefully to be able to communicate their status as openings begin to occur. Uh, but I think most important, we have to remember that we're in an extremely fluid situation. Uh, as we said, we're, we are in uncharted waters. Um, just some support, um, you know, I have regular calls with lots of statewide and regional peer groups, industry groups, some of the ones that we interact with are the International Downtown Association, International Festivals and Events Association, there are many others who are doing webinars, who are doing uh, conference calls. These have been very important for all of us, I think, to stay connected with, uh, stay grounded. Uh, and other nonprofits in the community. I try to have a regular calls with other nonprofits to share ideas about what's happening um, with them, as well as business groups like the Chamber of Commerce, Retail Merchants, Retail Region Tourism, and of course, MBL, who we're all engaged with. And then the resources that we have on our website, this is a kind of a laundry list, and I don't expect you to, to memorize it, but do go to our website. Uh, we, we have a longer list than this, uh, sort of in the, in the COVID information button on our website. Um, and I kind of raced through that, but that's uh, my presentation. And I think that we're going to perhaps um, have some questions as we move forward. That's absolutely right, um, Lisa. Thank you so very much. Um, one thing I would I was going to say that was really, really good and, and spoke to me about what you just said was having a routine. So I'm going to come back to that and question and answer if people don't speak up first, because I definitely find uh, it's not my strong suit. <laughs> uh, okay, so we will now hear from Damon Jicketts, who serves as the executive director of Peter Paul Development Center. Uh, which is an outreach and community uh, center that serves um, Churchill. And Peter Paul's core program is intensive educational uh, program serving almost 400 students daily at the center and Easton Elementary Schools. Peter Paul also provides services for senior citizens and partners with an array of organizations to address basic needs of the residents in the community. Mr. Jiggets is also the founder and principal consultant of Resource Partners LLC, which supports nonprofit and small business operations, organizational development, strategic planning, and provides executive coaching. Mr. Jiggets, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Well, good afternoon, and thanks again for um, having me and. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and, and healthy uh, in the midst of everything that's going on and adapting to our new normal uh, for however long this exists um, and presents the challenges. And, and I guess before I get into my slides, um, I'd like to kind of set the tone for how we've been uh, approaching COVID and our response through Peter Paul. And it's and I really I see this as, again, another opportunity as opposed to a challenge. And I'll explain why I see COVID as an opportunity um, as I kind of go through these slides. But uh, just to get us started, <clears throat> here's our purpose statement. And I would like to just read it, if I could, uh, verbatim, because um, I want to point out a few uh, key phrases and words throughout this statement here. Our purpose is to educate the child, engage the family, and empower the community. We build competence through our individualized educational experiences, our family and community engagement initiatives authentically build connections between staff, volunteers and families. And those who serve become more confident in themselves as they work with with us to design and implement strategies to uplift their community from the ground up. 
And I wanted to read that verbatim because uh, for one, um, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that this was created by my staff. This was, uh, this was not something that I created or our board of directors created. It was something that spoke to them as a team. Um, and it was something that they felt represented the essence of who we, who we are at Peter Paul. And um, it really speaks to the competence, the connections and the, comp, comp, and the uh, confidence that we want all of our children and our families to have. Anyone who's engaged at Peter Paul, we want them to be equipped with uh, their, the relationships they would need. Uh, the aptitude, the the skills, the, the the capacity to properly care for their families, but and but even more important than that, we want them to show up positively in the community and 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 really pour into their communities as they see fit. And so it's our it's our opportunity and our and our privilege to be able to support with support them and walk with our families and children uh, throughout their life experiences. And so um, I'm honored to serve as the executive director. Uh, this, my staff refer to me as chief cheerleader. Um, and I love that because uh, my measure of success has always been the success of those around me. And as long as uh, those around me, including my staff and my children and my families, as long as they're experiencing brothers of success, then I know that I know that my God is smiling on me. I know my organization will be well taken care of and everybody will benefit because of it. And so um, that's that's very important to us. And it's a part of our culture um, at Peter Paul as well is just making sure that everyone is is delivering the best of who they are um, and bringing that to the table. Um, so COVID-19 impact. Um, <clears throat> here's some of the uh, the programs uh, that we offer, most of the programs that we offer through Peter Paul and uh, specifically it's kind of to a point. So of course our 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 day-to-day -day operations and our after school academies, we've got four elementary school sites and our main center on 22nd Street. Um, of course, it's not business as usual there. Uh, we've had to adapt and evolve um, in terms of how we're staying connected to our children and families. And so we have uh, virtual classrooms that we've created. Uh, so our teaching staff who, um, who are staying engaged, and I'll explain how they're able to stay engaged in a minute. Um, but they're creating virtual classrooms and activities to share with our students and, and their parents so they can stay engaged and continue in their educational journeys uh, while they're out of school. Uh, family engagement, um, our family engagement department, they're trying to stay connected and responsive uh, to the needs, the expressed needs of our families. Um, the Community Action Network, that's, a, that's a, a cadre of a number of subject matter experts across various domains of health and wellness, employment, housing, uh, education, of course. Uh, this, this, this CAN or this Community Action Network under normal circumstances would meet periodically throughout a given month and they design uh, strategies for achieving success in their, in their respective action teams or act their um, subject areas. Um, our senior citizens, um, you know, we wanna make sure that they're not being isolated. This has been a legacy program for Peter Paul for as long as it's been in existence and we're, we're uh, just celebrated our 40th anniversary, um, but making sure that we're staying connected to our seniors who can't come to the facility uh, right now, and so um, making sure that we're able to deliver food and essential goods and products to them and making sure that we're communicating with them, just saying hello and, uh, you know, just speaking with them on the phone or just, you know, whatever the case may be, just making sure that they're not uh, being overlooked and or neglected. And, um, and, they, and, and they don't allow us to do that either. I'll say that that's a very outspoken group. Um, they, they want to contribute. They don't want to be seen, be seen as a charity case. And so they're constantly reminding, of, reminding us of the fact that they can help too. And they want to help in the midst of COVID um, as well. And so, uh, you know, I can respect that and love that about them. Uh, food distribution. Um, I may speak to this a little bit more, but that's been, that's been a difficult one for us. You know, um, it's difficult for any organizations or individuals to have a physical presence in our community, but this is an essential need. And given the fact that we're in the center of the community we serve and have been a trusted community partner uh, for so many of our neighbors, uh, we felt compelled to try to stick this out as long as we can. So we've employed all of the precautionary uh, you know, recommendations and even beyond to ensure the safety of our staff, uh, those who are coming out for food distribution as well as volunteers. Um, speaking of our staff, um, our staff is a, um, close to 90 employees 
uh, most of whom at the beginning of this mess, um, we, had, we had some tough conversations amongst my staff and my, my administrative team and our board of directors. And uh, we were preparing ourselves for uh, laying off, you know, all of our, our uh, part-time staff. Um, and that was a hard pill to swallow. Um, it was a very difficult conversation on a number of levels for me, uh, not only on the budgetary side, but just in terms of just knowing people on a personal level and knowing the relationships that many of my staff had with their children and their families, that's hard to replace. You can't just fill seats in this type of, in this type of organization. And so we wanted to retain them as best we could. And uh, fortunately, we were able to uh, access um, the funding through the, uh, the uh, payroll protection um, program uh, that covers our, our staff uh, uh, payroll um, in, until well, through June. So we were really, really excited about that. If you want to talk about a shout, that was a, that was a shout moment um, when we got the word of that. And uh, the money actually hit my account on yesterday, so I was pretty excited to see it in the bank account. So we're good, we're good to go for right now, and, and the staff is very excited about that. Um, being very creative about how we utilize our volunteers, essentially they've become delivery drivers for us. Uh, you're making sure that our families get what they need. Uh, they're helping out as we speak with delivering laptops to students um, across the city uh, and um, our staff, they're helping out with that as well. But as Lisa mentioned, you know, as an organization, we're, we're facing some funding challenges and we had three events that were scheduled for this spring that we're no longer able to carry out because they were all gonna be um, you know, uh, events that would, you know, congregate people. And so we can't do that. And so we've got a significant gap that we're trying to fill. Um, and the, the opportunity again, as I see this, is this has really been a, like an awareness campaign for us during COVID, not only for Peter Paul's purposes, but any cause related organization out there in the community, people have a, a heightened less, a level of sensitivity for the issues and the fact that they're all being exacerbated right now uh, brings people to the table in ways that we couldn't have solicited on our own. And many of the contributions that we're receiving at Peter Paul have been unsolicited contributions. Um, and so that's, that's been a blessing. Um, so here, here's, here's where we are. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest thing that we've benefited from has been the uh, payroll protection uh, program. Uh, of course, the Community Foundation, and I know many of you all on this call are aware of the, uh, the fact that the Community Foundation and many organizations or foundations around the city and around the region are definitely leaning, leaning in and thinking in very innovative and new ways of how they can um, you know, uh, adapt to this as a funder. Um, and so just thinking outside of the box and, uh, and, and that's been um, wonderful to hear and see and working with our foundations and corporate partners uh, to think outside of the box and how they can kind of bend and shift uh, uh, to, in response to during COVID. Um, here's one example I just wanted to just share. I love this. Our family and community engagement team, uh, they pulled together these virtual parent and caregiver hangouts. So again, this is something that takes place and anyone can join in if you wanna just let your hair down, um, you know, and just kind of decompress from all of the stressors that come along with COVID-19. Here's an opportunity for our parents and, and caregivers to just engage in one, with one another um, and just support one another and deal with the stress. And um, so it, it is exactly what it, it says on, on this flyer right here. And, um, again, just one of many opportunities that our staff have been creating to just stay engaged with our families. Um, <clears throat> and here, here's, an, here's another strategy. This is something that, again, um, my team, they're leading this effort. And in terms of leadership, uh, that's exactly been the way that I've approached it. If there are opportunities for anyone on my team to assume leadership, hey, I feel obligated to give them the keys to the car. You know, particularly they have, if they have a passion for something or have a level of expertise like the utilization of technology, or if they are a great cheerleader or team builder, then all right, as opposed to myself and my administrative team trying to create strategies to keep us engaged and keep the morale up, they love doing it and they're looking for ways to help out. So I've just really uh, granted them this opportunity. So this past Friday, we had a, uh, a happy hour uh, of sorts, and it was a team building happy hour. We played all kinds of games like scavenger hunts, um, quizzes on all things Peter Paul, just to get an idea of who knew what about Peter Paul and who needs to know more about Peter Paul as a staff member. Um, 
you know, we're going to get into a karaoke. And I threw out the idea of a, of a 90s hip hop karaoke day, you know, because uh, that's what I love. And so, I mean, as a leader, they need to feel they need to feel me just as much as I feel them. And so, um, you know, just wanted to be relatable and somebody that's approachable. Um, and so I, I'll say this and I know I'm probably running out of time. But one, in terms of leadership, one of the one of the most gratifying things I've experienced during COVID right now was during last week's staff meeting. And I had about 60 to 75 individuals on the Zoom call, right? And it was an update, an opportunity for myself and others to give updates on all things Peter Paul in the midst of COVID. And at the end of the call, it was a great call. And the fact that we had so many people who voluntarily showed up on the Zoom call, um, but it was great at the end of the call to see each, all of the staff members engaging with one another. They were just like, oh, I see your kids in the background. I tell such and such, I said hello. And they were just chatting and just having a wonderful time at the end of the call. The call was over and I could have just hit the button and ended the, the Zoom session. But I let it ride for about another five to seven minutes and just letting them just go. And I sat there just as I am now and it just was just smiling the entire time. And I say that because Again, they love each other, they love what they do, and it was an opportunity for them to just kind of just reconnect because they've been missing each other. They haven't been able to feel or touch each other for so long. And so affording them that opportunity was, was great for me. It was kind of like a, a reinvigoration, if you will, in the midst of everything and just kind of a, a constant reminder of what's most important. And it, is, and it is our people, those who work for us and those we serve, you know, and so, yeah, this is a challenge for us. COVID is, is a huge mess. It's a huge mess, but it's also an opportunity for us to bring out the best of ourselves. You know, we've seen that across the community. I'm seeing it amongst my staff. They're leaning in. They want to do more. They want to contribute. Um, so it, I think in terms of leadership, the way that I look at it is, you know, crisis gives us an opportunity to grow. Transition gives us an opportunity to grow. Change is something that's constant, and so it gives us an opportunity to grow. You know, it's my job as the leader of the organization in the midst of crisis when we're all anxious or, or nervous about how this is all going to play out, to just remind them that, you know, here's an opportunity for us to be comfortable with this sense of being uncomfortable. We're all uncomfortable, but how do we get through this and how do we take this discomfort and grow from it, grow through it? Um, and so that's, the, that's really been our approach. We can't see our kids, we can't engage with them directly, so let's plan. Let's figure out how to clean up our policies and procedures. Let's get things documented. Let's, let's do the things that we hadn't been able to do because we hadn't had the bandwidth. But now is an opportunity to, to make sure that everything is cleaned up. So when they do return, because they will, we want to be even more prepared than we were than before they left. Um, and so that's been my approach to leadership is just, you know, being very comfortable with the discomfort of change and transition, but seeing it as an opportunity to innovate and grow um, and, and just staying positive in the midst of all of this and reminding my staff to do that. And it's this has really been a rallying cry for us uh, more than anything. And so um, I think that was my last slide. Oh. I'll just finish with this. How much time? I haven't heard anybody say anything. I got my last two minutes or anything. Did I miss it? I haven't missed it. Okay. No, you're you're good. I was just about to uh, signal you right now. So if you have one more comment, that's fine. I do have one more comment, and that's this last slide. Um, and so there's a there's a there's a quote by Peter Drucker, who's a, a writer and um, has written a number of books. And it, it's it goes, "Culture eats strategy for lunch. Culture eats strategy for lunch." And what it means is that if you don't have the right behaviors and you don't have the collective responses and value systems in place, you can strategize and come up with all kinds of programs and ideas and, 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 and the like, but it won't matter if your team, if they're not rallied around it, if they haven't contributed to it, if they aren't under the same belief systems that you're in. So you can paint a picture, but if they aren't a part of painting that picture, if they aren't a part of creating uh, the direction the, the, the indicators of success, then they don't, they don't have that intrinsic buy-in. And so culture is so important to an organization. Um, it's been at the core of, of who we are at, at Peter Paul, and it's really uh, uh, contributed to our, our outcomes and our success. And so 
um, in the midst of COVID, it's the same thing. Trying to keep this culture in place and so staying as close as we can to our people um, has been so important. It's really been paying dividends. So I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, Damon. That was great. Um, culture eats strategy for lunch. I love that. I love that. Now remember that. And thanks again, Lisa. Uh, now, everyone, we're going to open it up to live Q&A. This is your opportunity, so please use this opportunity to ask our experts. Um, they can help you with your business or your organization. If you have a question for a particular person, please include that within your question. Um, again, you can use the Q&A, which we have, I know we have a couple in there uh, already, and I know there are some in the chat, but you feel free to raise your hand. I saw some folks uh, that are attending, Connie Holm, um, Kim Martin, I saw you, Malcolm Jones. I know you folks aren't shy. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll open it up to you. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Catherine who will lead us through Q&A. So Kat, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Andrea. Great job, panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Those are some excellent, excellent tips for all of us. So we are really glad to have you here. Our first question that we have is from Mr. Brown, and this question is directed towards Mr. Jiggetts. So does your organization work with nonprofit community-based vocational trade programs? And if so, he would like to email you and set up a time to talk about when you could come together. So could you possibly answer that question for us? Sure. Um, we definitely work with an array of partnering organizations through our action teams. I, I referenced our community action network on one of the slides. Um, that is run by our director. Her name is Kim uh, Young, Kimberly Young. And um, the best way to get connected, I could definitely get you in, in contact with Kim, but there's an opportunity if you're looking for um, a connection to a vocational program or organization, or you want to contribute some resources to our collective work um, in the East End community, we'd love to talk with you about that. And I'm happy to uh, get, you, get you connected to the right people. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mr. Maynard, he made a comment towards um, both of you and he said culture is everything and it really shows in tough times and what a true statement. So thank you, Mr. Maynard for reaching out with that. That was excellent. Another question from Mr. Jones. This question is directed towards you, Mr. Jiggetts. What are you doing as an individual to encourage yourself during COVID-19? A loaded question for today. Mm. Mm. Um, service, service, I would, I would say, um, so, you know, I wear a hat for Peter Paul, um, but I'm also, uh, assume some responsibility for coordinating the city's grassroots transportation response, um, during COVID. Uh, so working with the, 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 um, working with the city, um, and the, uh, DCAO of human services office, um, to really coordinate vendors and volunteer groups uh, in an effort to respond to the express needs of our community. So if an individuals reach out, um, I'm essentially helping to refer uh, individuals to any one of our uh, drivers or um, um, organizations that can either pick folks up and take them where they need to be or deliver um, essential items uh, to to those to those requesters and so um, that's that's really uh, that's really been my approach to just kind of staying um, staying upbeat and staying engaged just trying to figure out how to serve um, beyond that music therapy uh, I'm a huge music fan um, and so I do quite a bit of that um, and um, I've been eating way too many snacks uh, so so that's that's been constant. Um, but you know things like this Zoom, you know, has been wonderful in terms of uh, creating new opportunities to engage with uh, you know friends and family, as well as um, colleagues. Uh, and so that's always been very encouraging to use this platform to just see everyone's faces as opposed to just like you said an email or a text message. It's a little bit more personal, about as personal as we can get uh, these days. And so. Um, that's just been my approach, you know, service and just trying to just boost my communications on a personal level. Hey, Music Catherine. Yes, Catherine, it's Andrea. I'm going to um, 
have you ask the same question of Lisa, because that's kind of in the same vein that I was going yes, to absolutely. ask as well. Um, but before Lisa gets her answer together, I just want to say a special hello to uh, someone that has been completely committed to this cause from the very beginning. Um, I'm sure if she knew this was, she would have rather had a heads up that this was coming, but she didn't. And so she has been in this fight um, and that's Tracy Wiley. If you all know her, she is the agency director for um, the Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity for Virginia. So Tracy, if you're there and if you raise your hand or we ask you to speak and we're going to come back to you, you don't have to. I just made the pressure hot right now for you, though. Um, but we'll have a little time because I'm going to have Lisa answer the questions. So if you'd like to, we'd love to have you, you join us. Um, uh, to talk and address address our big crowd. So we'll come back to you. I see your hand raised. So we'll come back to you after Lisa's um, comment. Okay, Mrs. Sims, this one's up to you. So how do you uh, handle this on a personal basis as well? Oh, wait, you're on mute. Let me unmute you. There you go. Okay, thanks. Um, hi to Tracy out there, first of all. Um, but, you know, a much much like Damon said, I, you know, for me, I think what keeps me motivated is frankly, uh, the responsibility I feel toward the staff, um, who I think, um, you know, whether they do or not, I feel that, um, there, a certain part of them is depending on me to sort of help keep things moving along every day. Um, but the other is all the downtown stakeholders, uh, who we have responsibilities toward, we want to make sure that everything we're doing um, is is reflecting well upon them, is keeping downtown in as good a shape as it as it is now. So I think for me, it, it's just a almost I almost feel like we are <laughs> sounds crazy, but we're working harder now than we did before. Um, every morning I wake up earlier. I'm online earlier. I'm online longer. Um, and it's just a sense of responsibility, a feeling that it, we got to keep this moving. And as Damon said, I've been shocked, frankly. I didn't expect, when, I mean, when we first came home to work, um, I was really sort of despondent and a little bit uh, down. How are we going to do this? How are we going to stay in touch? How are we going to, you know, how are we going to be? And Zoom has been really amazing. Um, so I miss people. I miss hugging people. I miss shaking people's hands. Um, but I just feel a, a lot of responsibility and that keeps me, that keeps me going, keeps me motivated. I understand that. I understand that. Um, and I did promote you, Tracy. So I'm going to unmute your mic. Tracy, I promoted her to panelists, if you will. So, um, Tracy, we're going to come to you next. Okay. So, uh, whenever you're ready, Tracy. Thank you, Andrea. That was really sweet. I have to admit, I was enjoying um, my lunch. I had a little salad here. And as soon as you said that, I just put a fork to my mouth and thought, can they see me eating? But anyway, um, thank you, everyone. I, I, it's so good to see uh, Lisa and Damon. Um, it's great to see the All About Presentations team and my, my regards to NBL. Um, I love the conversation. I love the slides and things that you all have just shared. Um, I guess if the question is presented to me as you presented it to the others, I would just say that I agree with what Lisa said. We have a sense of responsibility. Um, it is our duty and our responsibility to our mission to continue to keep pushing and fighting and moving and learning. I sat here today to learn from the two of you um, how you're managing the strategies for leadership because I appreciate and respect the leadership of what Lisa's doing um, at Venture Richmond and what Damon is doing as a former board member for uh, Peter Paul. I'm still excited about what he has been able to do over the last few years as well. I think for me specifically, and I'll just be really quick, um, our businesses are reaching out to us every day on email and on phone and to hear some of their challenges and sometimes discouragement or frustration 
we're sitting in the middle right now um, at the state level and trying to be the best communicators of new information from SBA and the SBDCs and what's happening at the federal level. And we feel a little bit sometimes as if we want to do more. Uh, so we're being a good communicator. We're waiting to see what state resources will be available to small businesses. But in the interim, we're just acting as a facilitator to them and, and, and providing good strategies and keeping their spirits up and telling them there is hope and things are going to turn around. Um, but I am very interested in continuing the conversation through recovery now. Um, there's been a lot of response, but now we need to think about what happens in the next uh, 90 to 120 days. And so that's where we are. So thank you, Andrea, for allowing me to be a part of the conversation. And I will continue to listen until you call on me again. <laughs> Ms. Wiley, before you leave, we do have one other question for you. So before you um, go back to enjoying your lunch, what has been your biggest challenge during COVID-19 and how are you navigating through it? Um, is this my biggest challenge personally or as the agency? Because they're a little bit different. Um, it is from an anonymous attendee, but it does not okay. specify. Yes. So okay. however you feel fit. Well, I'll just say, um, personally, it's tough for me because I am an extreme extrovert. So this has been tough for me to be able to not be with my teams, um, on a regular basis and have that, uh, one-on-one -on -one interaction with them personally. Um, but we have learned, as Lisa mentioned, through Zoom to, to have some really good and creative conversations um, through technology. Um, from an agency perspective, I alluded a little bit to that in that we are serving in a supporting capacity right now to SBA and the federal government in terms of what relief efforts are available. And we're used to being able to put our hands on a solution for our small businesses that's right within our agency, whether it's developmental through our business development and outreach services, or whether it is through our financing authority with the tools that we have. Um, but those tools are not relief tools. They are for our existing customers right now to try to help um, defer loan payments or to look at ways in which to um, lower the interest rates on current and existing products. So we don't have the products that I would like to be able to deliver to them to create this immediacy that they need for their financial relief. And that's been probably the greatest challenge for us. But I'm hopeful and optimistic that help is on the way. So I'll keep you guys posted on that, hopefully within the next couple of days. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Wiley. The next question that we have is also from Mr. Jones, and this one is for Ms. Sims. Could you please elaborate more on your budget scenario planning session? Who was involved in the process, and did it take a while for you to plan it out? Oh, yes, it took a very long time to plan it out. Um, there were a lot of people involved. Uh, we had um, our finance committee chair, uh, who is Darius Johnson, who's a, just a great, great person, has a great, uh, a great mathematical mind. Uh, Darius was very involved with us, and he is the one who said we need a monthly cash flow uh, scenario stat, um, and that's what we were working on. But in terms of the budget scenarios, uh, it was a real team effort. Uh, we have a lot of different budgets. Every event has its own separate budget. Um, all of our all of our different sort of uh, riverfront has its own budget, clean and safe. So we were looking at all the staff members who were helping manage those budgets to make cuts after cut after cut. Uh, initially, we started out saying, well, maybe we look at this, uh, you know, for a, a three month or six months and then nine months. Uh, and, and we just sort of, sort of felt like we were spinning our wheels. Um, we didn't feel that we were really getting where we needed to go and we, we weren't gonna have anything to really act upon. And that's what brought us to the worst case scenario budget. So many of our things involve people who are, so many of our things, some of our projects involve people who are in close proximity with each other. Um, so we really have no way of knowing in reality when people are going to feel comfortable getting back in that situation. We look at a canal boat cruise, are people really going to want to put, you know, 35, 40 people sitting shoulder to shoulder on a canal boat, even after things have opened up? 
Um, and, you know, if we can only put 10 people on a canal boat, is it even a viable operation at that point? No, it's not. So, I mean, we went through this individually, both with our finance chair, our treasurer, our finance committee chair, as well as the finance committee, uh, our executive committee, and all staff members. So it was a long and tedious process, frankly, but um, we've gotten to a place that I, I think we're all, um, we're all comfortable with where we are now. I hope that answers the question. I believe it did. Thank you. Um, one other question for Damon. I assume your staff is working remotely. How are you keeping your staff accountable with responsibilities? Are expectations now different? And what's your method of success so far? Um, I'll start with the last question. Our method of success going forward would be how many of our staff return to us when, when we return to normal. So that retention rate is uh, so important to us given the relationships uh, that they have with our families. Um, in terms of accountabilities, uh, they can't, you know, interact directly with our, with our young people at this moment. And so uh, we're really just leaning on them to contribute to uh, lesson plans that are going out. We have several staff members who love being the face of these virtual classrooms. Um, and so we're asking staff to like work together in teams across locations. So uh, we're in four of the five elementary schools in, in Church Hill. And so they're working collaboratively to create lesson plans for the entire school. Um, and so it's been that type of an approach. And so not so much looking at, at them as individuals, but you know, how can they work collaboratively across their respective schools uh, to really lean in and stay in communications. and the biggest measure outside of just make, you know, hoping for, hoping that most of them will, will return to us is just um, the communications, you know, the communications that they're having with our, our children and our, and our families and making sure that we're able to respond um, as quickly as we can. Um, that's, that's, that's been pretty much it. It's, it's been pretty, it's been pretty loose in terms of uh, any kind of day-to-day -day expectations, but just keeping people at the table in, in, in hopes that everyone will return to us um, on the back end of this. Um, we are doing some, some considerable planning, of course, uh, for the summer, not knowing exactly what that will look like. Um, we're assuming that it will be more of the same in terms of virtual lessons and enrichment activities. Um, you know, but we're anticipating that we may not even be able to get into uh, those four um, elementary schools in the summer. So what will that mean in terms of we got 400 students, we can't get all 400 students into our main center. So what will that look like? And so we're budgeting for the best case scenario, business as usual, but we're planning for a worst case scenario uh, in terms of serving fewer students for fewer hours, for fewer days, um, and possibly at a, in a virtual kind of uh, platform. Uh, so yeah, just budgeting for the best case scenario and then just planning for the worst case scenario. Excellent, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you that if you wanted to put in a question, to write it in the question and answer box, or you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your hand as well and it will be answered. I do have an additional question now. Um, this is for both of our speakers. What are you all doing for the local businesses who are scared of going out of business and in some cases already out of business? There will need to be some sort of re revival of the human spirit to get folks motivated once we get through this. How would you answer that? Denise, if you want to start. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that um, as, as we sort of went over already, what we have been doing is trying to stabilize the organization, sort of put on our oxygen mask first. Um, and as we go forward, uh, what we're looking to do is help with marketing uh, and have a lot of the people who are stakeholders in downtown help guide those marketing efforts. Um, it's very difficult to market and promote um, when businesses might not be open. Um, we don't wanna be silent. Uh, we're still trying to promote downtown, particularly via social media, uh, but we also don't have a lot of money to spend right now. So we're trying to wait until we've get more direction from the businesses and from the government uh, about what can happen. And then we'll be working with the downtown stakeholders on the best way to go about 
bringing people back downtown. So at the moment, um, you know, there's not a whole lot we can do as a marketing organization other than remind people that downtown is viable, it's a great place to be, it's a safe place to be, uh, and then sort of kick in when everything begins opening back up again. Yeah, um, I don't have uh, too much of a connection to local businesses, but I will say um, the, 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 the one that stands out to me right now um, is the market at 25th, the grocery store that uh, opened up not too long ago in, in Churchill. Uh, you know, it's been a, a food desert, if you will, and uh, that grocery store has had its, its share of struggles here um, since it opened up. Um, and so we don't want it to go away because it's sorely needed. Um, and so one of the things that we did during COVID was ask for our supporters to purchase gift cards from the market at 25th um, at any, you know, at any amount. Um, and then, uh, so we've been collecting um, quite a few gift cards. Like we've got, we've got more than we could have even dreamed of uh, to support our families. But Again, that helps with the grocery store and, and, and just kind of, you know, just sending people right back uh, to the grocery store and spending money there. And so uh, that's been our intentional effort, um, you know, it's just really helping the market at 25th. Outside of that, I can't think of too many other businesses other than helping some of our parents get to work, uh, making sure that they are actually getting where they need to be, particularly if they're in cent essential personnel. Um, so we have been doing a bit of that. Uh, but I can't speak to the specific businesses that we're supporting in that way. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. We have one last question, but we do want to let you know that we are moving into our lightning round now because we are closing up. So we have one last question for our speakers. To all, what advice could you give a leader who is struggling with how to navigate through this pandemic? Many of us are stressed and don't know where to begin. Um, well, I'll, I'll start there. Um, and I think I alluded to this in, uh, a little earlier. I see this as an awareness campaign. So this is a, as, because people are listening and people are trying to figure out how to lean in. This is an opportunity for us to sound our horns more so than ever before. Um, we're in the process of trying to build um, really what will be an online campaign, um, you know, just to promote Peter Paul and the East End. And so uh, this is just an opportunity to be even louder than we've ever been before in terms of our fundraising and our promotional opportunities. So um, that, that would be my suggestion is take this opportunity to just really assert your voice. Yeah, I think, you know, as I, I think it is a struggle. Um, and I, I think you have to, first of all, I think you have to be kind to yourself. Um, it's something that, that we talk about as a staff often, um, don't beat yourself up. Um, th this is really hard. It's really hard to continue things as normal when nothing is normal. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So be kind to yourself. And if you're struggling, you know, try to connect with someone immediately. Get on Zoom with a friend, get on Zoom with a coworker or colleague, get on Zoom with another leader of an organization, reach out to people, try and structure your day, try to have an appointment every hour or every other hour if you, if you, if you can. Try to set a time every morning maybe, 9.30 that you have a coffee with someone. For 30 minutes, you sit with a leader of a similar organization and drink a cup of coffee. It's not too much time for everybody's calendar, but if it, it provides some structure to start your day off. Uh, if you have a staff, have a staff meeting every morning. It, it's not gonna be cumbersome to people. Have that staff meeting, get on Zoom, everybody talk. It's just a way to touch base, to remind everybody we're at work. This is not a snow day. <laughs> when this is real, we are still working. So I think um, I think you have to really focus on, and reach out to people. If you're trying to do it by yourself at home, you will, you will drown. You'll, you'll just become, I think, lost. You've got to help find, that's how I am anyway. I have to have other people to help me feel structure and to help me feel that I'm moving forward every day. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for both of your perspectives on this. I think it's going to help everybody tremendously. So thank you for that. Great leadership. So I just want to reiterate to both of you, um, we have lots of people in the chat who have said thank you and congratulations and really been very, um, very glad to be here today with your information. Um, huge congratulations and kudos on keeping the staff in great, engaged, Damon. Um, totally enjoying the town hall. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa and Damon, nice presentations, great presentations. So again, everybody is very, very happy and excited. Um, about this particular topic. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, and thank you all of you for your additional questions. Andrea, back to you. Thanks so much, Kat. Great job. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, please do, if you still want to connect in the chat, please do so. Uh, as planners, we're here for a little while after this ends. So if you want to connect in the chat, we'll be here to allow you to do that. If you want to talk to folks or if you have been talking to folks and want to continue, please do so. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Melody to close this out. So Melody, please. Thank you so much, um, Andrea. Thank you so much, Lisa and Damon, for carving out time from your day away from your families and your teams to share with us ways in which you've been leading and encouraging your organizations during this time and giving us a snapshot of ways in which you've made the pivot to ensure your ability to continue serving the community. Tracy, you are MBL family, so it's always a joy having your support and participation on these calls. Um, we're grateful for all the work you do in supporting our small businesses. To our attendees, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, we're hopeful you're leaving the session more informed and encouraged, thanks to the gems provided to us by Lisa and Damon and Tracy today. Um, today was actually originally slated as the last session in the six-part series, but due to the incredible feedback we've received, we will continue the town hall series um, by offering additional content crafted to serve the small business community. With that said, if there are any resources uh, you guys on the call are in need of, any topics um, that you think will serve you and your organization you'd like for us to feature, please contact me um, via email at mshort at the mbl.org. Again, that's mshort at the mbl.org. In closing, we ask that you continue to follow us on social media platforms to include Facebook at the MBL and Instagram at MBLRVA for the latest information on resources, programming, and special events in support of minority and women-owned businesses. I thank you again for your time to our panelists and our attendees. Um, and we are done here. Make it a great day, everyone.